Emily Pinton, go check her out. Carnivore Minds is her username over on Instagram. Uh, she is Jesus people. I love that you start with that. That's kind of cool. Uh, a mama, a wife, an online transformational coach, which we're going to talk a lot about the things you talk about in your philosophy. And you've overcome both multiple sclerosis and bipolar. So really amazing with a carnivore diet. Duh, carnivore minds. Um, and so I'm really glad to have you here today. It, you're funny because uh, I was asking you what you wanted to talk about. And you're like, well, here's a few things, but whatever made you want to talk to me? And I'm like, girl, you've got, you got a story to tell. I want to get it out there. So why don't we start there? Tell us your story when you were very sick and how you overcame it. Um, well, you would think that, you know, multiple sclerosis would have been like the main thing, but I didn't know. I had multiple sclerosis. Um, I had had, once I got diagnosed, I can look back and see all the symptoms and I can see that I've been fighting it for 10 years. Yeah. You know, probably longer. Um, but I'm 42 years old now. And whenever I was 40, um, my bipolar disorder uh, went into rapid cycling and wow. it was debilitating. Um, I was out of work for six months and I have my master's in clinical counseling and I've been practicing as a therapist. So it was oh. terrifying to lose my mind. Yeah. You know, that was everything to me. I mean, that was my livelihood. Yes. Um, so uh, thankfully, my brother reached out and he just uh, told me about uh, Amber O'Hearn's story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Very famous zero carb dieter from way back, even when I first started. 17 years ago, she was already around, already eating this crazy diet everybody's talking, talking about called zero carb. It's now known as carnivore, but back in the day, they called it zero carb. Yeah. And there was something about it. Like I was in such misery. I was already in, I, I was at my most, I was on 900 milligrams of lithium, 80 milligrams of Prozac, wow. 80 milligrams of Adderall just to get out of bed every day. Wow. And I still wasn't functioning. I still wasn't, it, 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 it was, it was keeping me out of the psych ward. It was keeping me from killing myself. Yeah. But it, it was, I wasn't functioning. Um, Man, that had to suck at the age of 40, having all these things going on and you've lived with this. I'm assuming this, you were symptomatic at a minor level in your younger days and always older. It just got progressively worse and worse. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I wasn't diagnosed until I was, uh, I believe, 32, I wow. think, when I was diagnosed. Um, but, uh, you know, then again, just like the MS, I look back and I'm like, oh, that's why I dated that guy. Oh, that's why I, yeah. I did that. That's why I it, lost that job. <laughs> it adds such an eye-opening experience to what you've been through in your life. And you're also a mom. How old are your kids? My son is 13. Okay, you have one kid and he's 13. Because that has to be hard knowing that you went through parenthood with that 13-year-old since your mid-20s-ish, late 20s, when you had him until now. I mean, that, that had to kind of eat at you a little bit too of, dang, I wish I had figured this out a lot sooner. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, once we heal, that doesn't mean that, like, you know, the... The the, um, yeah. And that doesn't mean that like the sun comes out and the flowers yeah. bloom and like yeah. everything is beautiful. There's a path of destruction of 40 years of bipolar disorder that now I'm having to repair my family. Yeah. Well, and not just your son, uh, but your husband, even other like friendships and relationships that may be in when you are not in your right state of mind, you're like, crap, do I have to go like on a on an apology tour, <laughs> literally was out of my mind, you guys. Do they know your story? A lot of the people that you interact with that maybe you didn't have a great experience with? Um, a little bit. I do have a few um, like core people that um, they have seen the transformation and they, they've seen and they recognize the difference. Um, but there, there are definitely those other people outside of that, that inner circle um, that they're just like, oh yeah, let's wait and watch her crash. Let's wait and watch her. She's got bipolar. See, this is just a cycle. Yeah. She's, she's going to go back down. 
that would be my fear if I dealt with that kind of thing and then did see a change. It's like all the bridges I burned, uh, unbeknownst to me that I had burned them, but because of my behavior, because of the pathology that you're dealing with the bi with the bipolar, um, man, that would that that's hard. That's hard for you even now. I'm sure even processing of okay, well, the people that want to be in my life, I will accept them. They accept me and everyone else say la vie. That's life. I'm going to move on if they've moved on. Exactly. Exactly. And that has been a, a great tool that I have learned through this process to be able to increase my health by, yeah. by loving myself. Yes. You know, by realizing what a miracle it is that I'm still standing. Yeah. <gasps> <laughs> exactly exactly i mean it, it it and it gives me the the um amazing opportunity to get in the puddle with my clients and yeah. say okay listen we're gonna we're gonna go through this and not everybody's gonna care not everybody is gonna cheer you on and they're probably gonna continue to throw rocks at you like yeah. this is gonna suck but you're gonna be okay and the rocks being thrown at you is the norm. Like I think sometimes, and I've been an online public figure for a very long time, so I've had a lot of rocks thrown at me over the yes, years. Yes, I can imagine. And when people first start out and they kind of start to get a little more online prominence, they'll write to me and go, oh my gosh, something terrible's happening. I'm like, what? She, they're like, I'm getting hate mails. I'm like, congratulations, you have arrived. <laughs> there we go, there we go, yep. Um, so but it just fuels me now. Yes. So when did carnivore come into your story? Because it's a big part of your story. Obviously, you call yourself Carnivore Minds over on Instagram. Uh, talk about that. Um, so it was actually um, one of those weird things that I look back now, and it was a knowing. Um, it wasn't a, uh, an intellectual decision. Yeah. Uh, it was a knowing. My brother sent me the first chapter of Amber O'Hearn's book, um, and I listened to it on February 23rd of 2019. I went from the standard American diet to overnight 100% um, carnivore. Whoa. February 24th, 2019. Well, as somebody who went from like hyper standard American diet, I mean, the crappiest of crap foods you could eat and gobs of it. Yeah to 20 grams of carbs on the Atkins diet. I know what that feels like. And it's like, I've never done drugs in my life, uh, Emily, but I kind of feel like I know what it feels like to come off of hard drugs because of the sugar I let go of. That, that had to be like stark for you. And I wasn't just kind of standard American diet. I like when I would make cookies, I would make two batches of chocolate chip cookies so that I could bake one batch and I could yeah. eat the dough of the yeah. other. Yes. Um, entire Guilty. pizzas by myself, um, cartons of ice cream. Yes. Um, but whenever I, I would all the time go to Walmart and get these cream horn uh, and they came in a, a pack of six and I would go to the car and eat all of them. Yes. Man, you, you're telling on me now, too, because I all do that kind of eating in shame and private kind of thing back in our carb days. And yeah, when, when that's your norm and then you go to all meat. That had to be a shock. Yeah. But um, the blessing was that I was already in the pit of mental illness hell. Yeah. And so it was just another pile of crap. It was just another pile of terrible going through the transition of breaking that addiction of sugar and carbs. Um, so, it, yes, it sucked. Yes, I felt like I had the flu for a week. Um, yes, the transition was difficult. But uh, once I got into the second week, third week, and I started feeling relief. Yes. I hadn't felt relief in years. Um, and then into the fourth week, um, I felt joy for the first time. And yeah. once I felt joy, it was a glimpse. It was only, I, I would say, five minutes that I felt it. But it was just like, oh, my gosh. It was like a hit of heroin yeah. to me. Because I had never felt joy like that before. Like genuine hope for my future. And it, it was, it was uh, addictive. It was the carnivore nirvana, or what, what is it? Zen. Some, on one of these podcasts said, it's the carnivore zen, Jimmy. I'm like, I know, I know. Yes, yes. 
Mm -hmm. I see uh, Thankful Carnivore is on here, Brett Lloyd, and he has a similar kind of mental health uh, story where he's overcome things doing carnivore. And so lots of people are using this. Why do you think, and I kind of know the, I know the answer, but why do you think nutrition is so devalued when it comes to mental health and trying to restore the mind? Is it just because it's easier to prescribe the meds because that's the standard of care and that's the way we've always done it? Never mind, you still feel like crap. This is what you're supposed to do. Take it and take more and more and more and more until the day you die and you go crazy. Well, I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole, okay. but I, I believe that we have been brainwashed since we were children. Yes. Um, and that we have been conditioned to be addicted to sugary cereals as a child. Um, to candy, um, you know, I, I, once I went through this transition, it shocked me how much sugar we give our children Yes. Um, and reward them with. So we've been conditioned as a child. So duh, we become adults who, yeah. who, you know, who eat just for comfort. Yeah. Um, and you, so it, it makes sense. It's a logical response. You skin your knee. Oh, here, have some candy. It'll make you feel better. Oh, you got good grades in in school. Oh, report card. Let's let's celebrate by going out to fast food. And it's like, yes, we we both celebrate and lament with the same drug, sugar. Uh, and I would also throw in crappy garbage. Pretty much any yes. part there, uh, grains, starches, sugars, all of them. Because once you get hooked on that, it's a part of the brain, and you probably know more about this than I do, but there's a part of the brain that gets excited with those things. And so then when you've got drugs that present themselves or uh, alcohol or any, uh, you pick your poison for addiction. It's that same part of the brain that's looking for that dopamine hit that you got from the sugar that sadly a lot of parents unbeknownst to them have allowed that to happen and then they wonder what happened when they got in their late teens early 20s and now they're addicted to some substance absolutely absolutely so i i feel like it's a logical progression that you know we were conditioned this way uh, as a society and 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 i don't blame our my parents i don't blame you know even parents today because they didn't know any better you know uh you know i've talked to my dad and his um his father worked for Pepsi Cola and, you know, would bring home cases of Pepsi Cola yes. and um, they would, you, you know, go to the discount um, uh, aisle at, uh, at the store oh, and yeah. um, buy the, the day old donuts and go put them in the deep freeze and they would eat frozen donuts. Like, you know, and, and once you really realize that there's no nutritional value in that, there is nothing that that is that sugar is doing to serve you. It's, absolutely it makes sense it's logical because we are completely malnourished yes and uh, my dad owned restaurants in the little small town that i grew up in in bolivar tennessee and nice he owned restaurants and yeah i mean it was just carbs after carbs after carbs with a little bit of fat and protein very minimal fat it was the 1980s very minimal fat but, you know, the protein source, but then lots of carbs all around it. It's why I got hooked on macaroni and cheese uh, very early in my life. I had plentiful on this buffet that I could just like pile up. Literally, I would come home from high school, go right to the buffet line on Wednesdays. I always looked forward to Wednesdays because that's when he put mac and cheese on there. And I would take a plate and I would literally put as much until it's like oozing off the side so much on that plate, Emily. And we wonder why we grow into the eating habits that we have as adults. Yeah. And, and honestly, I think it's, it's miraculous that we, uh, <laughs> the human body is so amazing that we have put all of these toxins into it and that we are surviving. Yes. It's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that we have survived. What's it going to look like when we put the good stuff in? Oh my gosh. I'm shocked I never got type 2 diabetes. I was 32 when I changed my diet to the Atkins diet and then eventually keto and now carnivore. Um, I'm surprised. 32 years of bombarding my body with the crappiest of crappy garbage you can think of. I mean, college was like ramen noodle arama because I would eat like 
or three of those at a time and melt American cheese on top of it and just have that as a meal. Mm -hmm. And I look at it now and it's like 69 grams of carbohydrate in just one of the packets of stuff. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, how did I survive? I'm now I'm very insulin resistant today because of it. Thankfully, I never got any autoimmune issues, kind of like what you did and, and the other issues that you dealt with. But man, like we just bombard our body. And you're right, our bodies are quite resilient from the damage we uh, put on it. So Gina said the whole mindset of thinking you're missing out if you don't eat carbs and sugar. Yeah, that's, that's the thing people, when you tell them that you go carnivore, and I assume you do tell people, hey, I, I eat meat, that's what I do. Um, that they're like, well, what, what about this? What you, you don't you, wait, you don't have vegetable. What, what they, they don't know how to process that because we've been conditioned and this is the narrative in our society. Um, and I think it was very intentional. Um, I think it was to make us sick, to make us sicker. Um, and, yeah, and I that's do. why they've quieted the voices like Atkins. Um, and that they have this whole horrible narrative about cholesterol. Yes. You know, that everybody's going to die. Um, and, y you know, I, I just today, like literally five minutes ago, got a call from my doctor um, because she said, you're on such a restrictive diet. I need to do a lipid panel on you. And, and I was just like, okay, do what you need to do. My yeah. results came back and my cholesterol is perfect. There is no problems. There's no question. Everything's within range. Well, and the problem with cholesterol is it's an incomplete picture. And you know this, but... yes. I wrote a whole book about it a million years ago called Cholesterol Clarity. And in there, you know, people always worry about their LDL and their total. And I'm like, no, look at your triglycerides. That's telling the story of the bad fat in your blood. Look at your HDL. And better yet, test your insulin level. See how your blood sugar is going. Those are far more interesting. And inflammation markers, those are very interesting markers, much more so than whatever your arbitrary total cholesterol is telling you. Yeah, and I'm not um, uh, very scientific at all. Um, I just knew that I was feeling better. And yeah. my mind was more important to me than my body. Um, and so I was just like, as long as my brain is clear, yes. everything else is going to figure itself out. <laughs> I have told people that I've I never lost another pound the rest of my life as long as I have this sharp brain that I have. Yep. I would go to my dying grave sharp and and be happy, even if I had extra weight on the body. And of course, the culture wants us to obsess about weight, which by the way, when you went carnivore, guys, she lost some weight. So go check yeah. on Carnivore Minds. Uh, you can see the before and after pictures. I'm scrolling real fast to see if I can find, because I know you had it on here. But anyway, she's lost a significant amount of weight, you guys. A hundred pounds. hundred pounds of weight. And of course, I think you would be the first one to say that that's yeah. cool, but getting your mind right, getting with everything under control were far more cool. Yeah, actually, I really liked being a big girl. Um, I liked, you know, feeling like a big curvy woman. Um, I thought I was beautiful. I still think I'm beautiful. I was beautiful at 240 pounds. So that wasn't my goal. That wasn't my intent. Um, but it. I had no clue how unhealthy I was and how much inflammation I yeah. had in my body. Well, and all of the healing from the MS and the bipolar, I mean, the healing happened because of the reasons why you lost weight. Like, this is the disconnect. People are like, I want to lose weight to get healthy. And I think that's the wrong order. I think you get healthy through nutrition and lifestyle and you got this nice little side effect of weight loss, and yet we put so much emphasis on the wrong syllable uh, on yep. this journey that people think, oh, I need to lose weight and, and just go after health and the weight loss will come. Absolutely, absolutely. And peace, going after your peace and your yep. mental clarity. Um, like, who cares what you look like if you're miserable? Yes. You know, if you're at, that's why diets didn't ever work for you because you were torturing yourself. And with this, you're satiating yourself. Yes. You're feeding yourself bacon and burgers and chicken wings and, you know, animal fat. And your body is finally going, oh, we can get on board with this. Like, right. yeah, okay, sister, like, let's go. Instead so, of, no, 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 no. 
So Emily, you're making me hungry. I'm in a fasting period right now. So um, uh, I just got off a 48 hour fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I fast well and I feast well. That's the fun part of fasting is when you're not fasting, you get to eat very well. And so tell us what it looks like for you in your day to day of how you do eat. Uh, I hate to answer that question because um, I don't want people to start where I'm at right now. Right. Well, um, caveat that you've done this a couple of years. You're in a groove. Go. Yes. Um, so I started out eating, uh, you know, chicken wings, bacon, burgers, steaks, um, pork, uh, fatty pork butt, uh, all the meats, um, salmon with the skin on. She said butt, you guys. It's on I her. said butt. I said I eat butt, <laughs> pork butt. Um, and uh, I noticed over time that I felt better or best on just beef. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's because, I mean, I'm in Southeast Missouri, um, and, and we have a lot of farms here locally, but yeah. all the farmers here locally sell to the big, um, the big, uh, meat processors. Yeah. So the stuff that I get in the grocery store here is actually not, you know, really the best stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I for me to find a good source of, of beef was, um, easier than for me to find a good source of chicken or, you know, pork or anything else. Yeah. Um, long story short, I started eating more beef. Um, and then I realized I felt so good on it that I didn't want to eat anything else. Wow. Um, and so now, um, I, I eat, uh, about half a pound of, uh, beef fat. Um, so that's just the beef trimmings. Um, this is just the, like, like, do what? Is that like suet? Is that what they call suet? No, um, suet is more of like a waxy. Um, uh, yeah. the, the fat that I eat is the trimmings. Like, like if you look at a ribeye, the, yeah. the white cap. Yeah. Um, so I eat a half a pound of that a day. Um, you look it up and drink it. How, how do you eat it? <laughs> That's the hard part. That's the weird part. Um, I realized that I, whenever I would cook the fat, it would start to make me queasy. And I just, I couldn't really digest as much, but I knew that fat was key for my mental health and for the deteriorated myelin yes. on my brain with um, the multiple sclerosis. Um, and so it was very important for me to eat a higher amount of fat. And I had this Instagram follower, um, I'll never forget her. Um, and she messaged me and she said, have you ever tried to eat it raw? And I was like, no, mm -hmm. that's silly. And she was like, just try it. It's decadent. And so I did, I just, I sliced off a piece of just raw fat and I, it was like cheese. It was so dense and so good and creamy. Now what I do is I just cut it up into little cubes, put it on parchment paper, stick it in the freezer yeah. and I eat it frozen, a uh, raw frozen, frozen salted. And I just pop it like, like it's little cheese cubes. I want to see you at a party, Emily. <laughs> You pop out your little Tupperware and you open it up and you start popping there. Oh, is that some cheese? Can I have some? It's fat. And they'll be like, uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, and, by the way, says it's not weird, Emily. You're not alone in eating the fat like that. So awesome. That awesome. Well, and I, I also eat it with chopsticks. Um, I don't know why, but I just, it's easier. It's easier than stabbing it with a fork. It's easier than. Cause you're fat. That's why you need some little chopsticks to look all fancy. <laughs> but I need to make a video of how I do it. Yes. I would... have so many people ask me and I, I need to do that. And chewing it so we can see that you're not gagging on it. So you can see that uh, you do chew it well. And I'm sure once it hits your body temp, it starts melting a bit in the mouth. So there's a nice little texture kind of thing going on in the mouth. It sounds like you got me wanting to do it now. I literally never had just straight up raw fat in the mouth. I've had it's bacon, a, bacon fat in the mouth. That's kind of weird, but never. It's amazing. Like I, I get this visceral response and that's how I knew. That's how I kept going on this journey was that I had this visceral response as soon as I, I took the first bite. And then like the next morning when I took the first bite, my body was like, yes, yeah, yes, this is what we want. Well, and with the, uh, with the issue with the bipolar and the MS and trying to control that, you knew the importance of the fat. I know in kind of the carnivore keto world, there's been a lot of like controversy in recent years about protein, fat, you know, which one is the more dominant. And I'm like, what's your goal? If your goal is 
trying to help with your brain. You need more fat. Like, there's no denying that. It's a high-fat diet. You still get ample amounts of protein in there. It's not like you're skimping on protein. You're not lowering protein. You're still having the meat, but then you're adding in this thing that helps with your brain health. I don't know why it has to be a controversial thing. You do you, boo. Don't worry about what other people are doing, <laughs> right? Exactly, exactly. So I eat half a pound of uh, beef fat, half a pound of beef. Um, so it's just like basically steaks um, just cut up. Yeah. Um, and uh, I eat uh, one pound of ground beef. And that's got a mixture of beef and fat. That is cool. But So I like to get uh, grass-fed, grass-finished beef from my local farmer's market uh, on Saturday mornings. And what's funny is I'm currently in this little protocol I'm doing called stay medical to 50. And I was loading up because I'm eating carnivore on the days that I'm not fasting. And so I was loading up. And so I'd go, how much ground beef do you have? Like, I want it all. And she's like, uh, I've got eight pounds. Yes, I'll take eight pounds. Let's go. And then like the next week, how much you got this way? Oh, I only have two pounds this way. I'll take it. And like a month leading up to this thing, I was like loading up. And she's like, what are you doing with all this meat? And I said, uh, oh, I'm doing this carnivore diet kind of challenge. I'm challenging myself. And she's like, so you're only eating beef? And I said, well, I'm doing some pork and some other things, but I do prefer the beef. And she's like, but, and she had lots of vegetables there too. And I'm like, nope. I don't eat those because they have anti-nutrients in them. And she, I mean, it just blew her mind when I started educating her. But that's like the challenge that you come with. But here's the problem. Because of all the kind of uh, processing centers are backed up, a lot of the beef suppliers, and mine included, they're not able to make it available. So it's getting harder to find quality uh, beef. Are you noticing that in Missouri at all? Um, I have a unique situation in that I have a direct relationship with my farmer. Okay. Um, and um, she has actually said, I don't care what happens. You will never you starve. Will. You good. will never starve. Um, and I've been completely committed to them um, yeah. uh, for a year now um, wow. and told them I'm not going to another farmer. I'm not going to Walmart. I'm not going to all these. You are my source. Yes. Um, and so cool. I have a freestanding order with her every month. I won't cheat on you with my diets. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> My one and only, and, and that's beautiful. And I used to have a farm uh, about 15 miles away. I would drive to the farm. I did a whole YouTube kind of series on them and all the things, and they were wonderful. And then, like, they went bankrupt, like, suddenly. Yep. Like, I don't have a farm anymore. And then the farmer's market opened, and so I have relationships with a few of the meat vendors, but all of them are, are having trouble. Uh, pork's not a problem, but... Uh, but the beef is. And so I don't like to overload myself with pork because there are a lot of omega-6s in pork that you don't want to overload your body with. I try to be mindful of that. And grass-fed beef has a lot of omega-3s that can then balance that out. And so you try to be mindful of all those things. I assume you do too. Uh, maybe throw in some offal every once in a while. Um, no, that, that's been a, a conversation that I've had with my farmer, um, that we, you know, I want to get some kidney or liver, you know, some other stuff. Um, but I just haven't yet. I'll tell you, start with the beef tongue. Okay. So happy because it's just another muscle. We like ribeyes and we like all the parts, the muscle meats. The tongue is a muscle too. And you can make like a little taco, uh, what do they call that, um, Langua, it's you can make it a little taco kind of meat. You don't have to eat a taco, but you could have it, and and sh it's like shredded beef basically from the tongue. Now you get over that it's sticking the tongue out at you when you cook it in the crock pot, but um, it's glorious and it's a nice kind of way. And and Becky's also saying, or try the heart. That's another muscle meat that's very nutrient dense. I've got a beef heart from my farmer's market in my freezer right now, so. I know it's hard because our brains want to go, eh, but it's hard, uh, but it's tongue, it's going to lick me back. Uh, and we kind of play all these mind games. But when you look at it as nutrient dense food to nourish you, it changes the game. I have to, I have another confession to make. Um, yeah. Not just raw fat. Um, I, I realized how easy it was for me to eat the raw fat. And there were little pieces of it yeah. on there that had meat on it. Yes. And I would just eat it. And then I realized how easy it is this way of eating. It's so simple. 
I wanted to push the envelope of laziness. All raw. And I was just like, what would it look like if I just didn't cook this? What yeah. would it look like if I just oh, ate it? You're not, you're not strange. I've had three other people come on my podcast and say that they eat all raw. All raw for the last year and a half. Mentally for Jimmy, that's hard because I'm I'm uh, I want to cook it. I want to make it fancy and and I don't know. I got uh, a trick. What's that? I got a trick for you. Oh, give me the trick. Okay, so you take a steak, you cut it into little cubes, you put it on parchment paper, put it in a container like a like a um, a Tupperware, and stick it in the freezer, and then you take it out the next morning and just put it on the plate and eat it frozen. Yeah, the texture's better. It's amazing, the crunch, and it's not like you're biting into ice, like you bite in and it's just dense, and it's delicious. It is, del just, just try, just try uh, uh, four ounces. So you're fooling your brain into thinking because the texture is tougher that it's cooked when it's just frozen. I guess so, I don't know, but it works for me. So I've, I've eaten it uh, frozen, frozen and raw. That's a good trick. You and your frozen and raw with both the uh, the fat and the meat now. So, okay, I will try that, Emily. Maybe I'll go on Instagram Live. Okay, this is all Emily Pinton's fault that I need this. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to make a video. I, yeah, I wonder you could make like little balls of like ground beef. I wonder if it would work the same way. Um, actually, my ground beef, what I do is I thaw it out in the refrigerator the night before. Um, so it's, it's just thawed enough that I can cut it and yeah. I, I cut it into slices and then I cut it into triangles and then I eat it with my chopsticks. Texas carnivore ranch wife says, no, 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 no raw for me. LOL, a grilled T-bone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The only thing I do want to say though, is that it's important that you know where your meat comes from. If you eat yeah. it raw, I would not eat out of the grocery store raw yeah. ever. No. I get it directly from my farmer and I know where it comes from. Thank you for that caveat, because that is so important. You've got to know the source of the meat before you try it raw. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of people I know that do exactly that. Uh, with, like, ground beef, they'll throw a raw egg or two on top of that and just kind of mix it in and eat it like that. Again, I'm not there yet, so I'm going to try your frozen to see if that will help. Uh, Gina says, I'm going to have to try that now, Emily. I love beef tartare. Well, yeah, that's as tartare as it gets. Yes, Perfectly. Yeah. So do you know how you got your MS and how you got the bipolar? Uh, I assume they kind of traced it back and to something. Was it something traumatic in your life that maybe triggered it? Did you have some kind of genetic component? What, do you know why? Yeah, mental illness is rampant in my family. Um, and uh, so that's pretty easy to track. Um, and then um, also there's some autoimmune disease. Okay. Um, so, and then you throw in the standard American diet and high, high, high stress. Yes. Um, because of my bipolar disorder, I made some very horrible choices in, in marriages. Yeah. Um, and that caused a lot of trauma in my life. Yes. Um, and so I was in survival mode for, I would say, from age 30. No, probably 20, 28, 27. I've been in survival mode wow. for a long time. Like, like didn't know what was going to happen the next week. Survival mode. Um, and so that, I mean, that right there is going to trigger any, anything that's under the surface. Can I just say that 14 years removed from like the, all that trauma beginning for you and really kind of ramping up in your life, you seem so well adjusted to life now. It looks like carnivore looks really good on you, both from the weight loss perspective, from the calming the brain, like I know it's hard for you to kind of contain your excitement about this, which is, again, why I wanted to have you on my show today. You asked, just bring me on. Why did you bring me on? This is it. Like, your story is unbelievable. I hear now the full context of your story, Emily, and I go, crap. Like, if you can overcome all those things, it makes you a powerful coach. Yeah, it really does. And, and 
what what I've recognized is that it's not because because when this first happened to me, I was just like, okay, cool. Like I just want to keep this all to myself. Like this is awesome. Now I can go out and be the best therapist in the world, and you know nobody's gonna understand my secret. You know, to to living this like you know Pinterest perfect life. Yes. Uh, but it wasn't important to me. What was important to me was crawling back into that pit of mental illness hell. Yeah and pulling out as many people as I could yes. to let them know that you're not broken. You're brilliant. That's the, that was the worst part was that I was in that pit of mental illness hell and I thought it was my fault. I thought I was just broken and screwed up in the head and I had no idea the brilliance that was inside of me until I was able to quiet the noise of the sugar and carbs and stop the addiction and then it was just like, oh, I really like me. This is awesome. Isn't it amazing how adaptive we are to suboptimal? Like we get so used to it. And in the midst of you not even realizing in your late 20s, going all through your 30s into your 40, that you had a huge issue going on, two of them actually simultaneously, um, that you kind of lived in a suboptimal way, but in your mind, it didn't feel suboptimal. It was just the way things were. And so then you come on the other side of that and you feel what optimal feels like. And you're like, holy crap, how did I put up with being suboptimal all those years? It's, it's revelatory. And when you put people on the diet and you help them out with your transformational coaching, I'm sure you see the same thing all the time in your clients. Oh, absolutely. And my favorite part is whenever because what I do is I set them up for um, to eat this way and to try and, and it doesn't have to be this we do keto we do I have some clients that um, include white rice um, everybody's at a different place yeah yeah um, so it's not dogmatic at all but what I do is I, I set up and I say okay let's let's do an experiment let's just do an experiment for 45 days and just see what happens yeah and then they get to the, like day 30 and they're like I want to eat this way for the rest of my life. I feel so good. Uh, uh. And then I'm just like, yes. I'm like, oh, but you can change it at 45 it, days. And they're like, no, no, I want this. I want this. And it, it's just the coolest experience. It is amazing when you allow people to have proof of concept. And it, it doesn't even take 45 days, like you said. They say 21 days to change a habit and to, and to build a new habit. Um, and definitely by 30 days, well within that new habit. I'm on day 35 of this stay radical thing. And I and thank you, not doing my daily walk, not doing all the biohacks that I'm doing, not fasting every other day, not eating just animal-based foods. And it's so funny because I know all these things, but it, it took kind of putting it into a protocol for a period of time that now the brain is like, oh, this is just what we do. There's not any thinking about it anymore. I get up in the morning. I'm like, okay, I got to go step on the vibration plate. And then I'm going to be taking the walk and I get back and I go into the infrared sauna and then I, I eat. And then I, I have everything just in my mind going and it's beautiful when it's on automatic mode. Mm, so beautiful. So beautiful. And, um, and really, you know, just getting past that sticking point. I think that nobody, a lot of people don't get past that sticking point. But once you get past that sticking point, everything opens up. Yes. Uh, Texas Carnivore Ranch Wife says, I also had a bad childhood because of a piece of crap father that I had. Carnivore really helped with the mindset. Tina said, yeah, me too, same thing. Uh, you don't even realize how bad you feel till you feel great. And, and that's true. Um, and I had childhood trauma major in my teenage years from 13 to 17. I was beaten and, and berated. And that's kind of what pushed me for comfort. Thankfully, I only stuck with bad food because uh, I know a lot of people start with the sugar like we talked about earlier. And then they go into hard drugs, alcohol, sex, you name it. They do all kinds of weird things to cover up pain. For me, food was my drug of choice, and I happily stayed in that drug of choice, but then it had other kind of life issues. You talked about like some of the, the relationships from your past weren't always the best, and, and I can definitely relate to that as well, both in friendships and other ways. And so it, it's a tough road to go, but then when you get your mind right, as you have now, and again, congratulations on your story, 
um, you have such an appreciation for life now because you realize how much of it you were just going through the motions of, and now you're being deliberate about what you're doing in your life. Yeah, and now it's, it's ridiculous. I'm like, I can't have a bad day. Like, no matter what comes at me, and I've had some horrible things come at me the past year. Um, and, and it was so, I was so like, what? Like, I overcame bipolar disorder and MS, and now this? Yeah. But, but it, what was so beautiful was that it paled in comparison. Like, it was just like, okay, <laughs> all right. You know, yep. like, somebody at work says something, you know, nasty to me or whatever. Like, oh, that's cute. Like, you have no idea where I've come from. <laughs> yeah. People often, like, applaud me for how I handle haters online because I get them. And they're like, how do you handle that? I'm like, look, I had the shit beat out of me every day in my teenage years. And I had a, a, a dad that basically told me I was worthless. No woman will ever want to be with you. You're, you're a piece of crap. I was an honor roll student. Wow. He, and and it was never appreciated. He was like, I'm going to send you to reform school. So people are like, wow, you handle haters well. I said, no, I had a big ass hater back in the day. You guys are nothing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So the inner clarity to change your diet and lifestyle. Obviously, you had outer motivation with the MS, with the bipolar, with you had weight on the body. Like you had a lot of things that really motivated you talk about how you talk to your clients with your transformational coaching that you do on providing that inner clarity does it come just from within um i i believe it does um i really do um because uh like i said i heard the information from amber o'hearn and and as you know if you know her she's got a lot of information and <laughs> it was all over my head. <laughs> She's quite nerdy if you've ever uh, met her. A lovely lady. I adore Amber to death. Um, and, but yeah, when you hear her talk, she also has written many scientific papers. She's not a PhD or anything. She's not an MD, but she writes scientific papers that get published. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. But it, so it wasn't the knowledge for me. It was the knowing. It was um, hearing her story. And I remember she said, that she, one day, her husband, she had been eating this way for two weeks, and her husband was like, hey, like, I'm afraid to really say this, but have you noticed how calm you are? Have you noticed how steady your mood is? Yeah. And she was just like, oh, my gosh. Yes. And then I thought about my family, and I was just like, gosh, that's what I want, because I was so irritable. I was so mean all the time. I was so angry because I was just, I was miserable. Yeah. You know, and I was lashing out on anyone and everyone in my in my environment. You were, um, in, you were taking an illicit drug called sugar. Yeah, but it was that knowing. And so I recognize that it's not knowledge that people need. It's them checking in with themselves and knowing yes. what they need to do. Yeah. And and sometimes they just need a little bit of help for somebody to hold them to that, um, to hold them accountable. Um, and so that's what I do is the whole first week they're like, okay, what are we doing? Tell me what to do. And I'm like, nope. I'm like, you're going to tell me what you think you should do. Yes. And I'm going to hold you accountable to your plan. Yes. And they're like, oh, <laughs> and then they come up with the best solutions because they know themselves. Yes. It's instinctive. Yeah. Yeah. What's funny is people are like, they'll write to me because they know I'm the keto guy and they'll be like, so how many carbs should I eat? I'm, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know what your circumstance is. I don't know what your level of insulin resistance is. I know nothing about you, but you know you. Yep. Start, like start somewhere. Look, if it's the wrong thing, adjust. Like people yes. are start because they're like, well, what if I get it wrong? I'm like, okay. Good. Yes. Go to the next thing to be right. Like, don't fail forward. Hate it. And, and that's the whole reason. I, that's what I talk about in Inner Clarity System is that this is an experiment. And it takes away that judgment. Because what does a scientist do? A scientist sets an experiment and then observes and documents. So that's all we have to do. Yes. Oh, the, the client ate an entire package of Oreos and then felt like crap. 
oh, okay. And then you document the next week, oh, the, the client ate three Oreos and stopped and felt better. So there's no judgment because I think when we get judgment and we get guilt, that's what paralyzes us yeah. is we think we're just this big failure. Or they think they're doing it the wrong way. This is why I kind of hate it when people try to put keto in a box, carnivore in a box of this is the way to do it. And it's like, no, you can, you can kind of do it your own way and see how it goes. I remember when I first started on the Atkins diet, a lot of the forums, there was no social media back in 2004, but there were forums and they were like, Atkins, my way. And I always <laughs> like what's that the atkins diet is a protocol but then they're like yeah i like the protocol in general but i want to do things a little bit different my way to make it work for me um and look that's a part of this the whole n equals one uh i started doing like experiments on myself all right let's see how this supposedly low carb bread impacts my blood sugar so i test the blood sugar holy crap that's not very low carb because it's going whack a doodle on me but it's like knowledge is power and when you do these things and, and you allow yourself to fail and stumble, I'm often telling people the road to success is a whole bunch of stumbles along the way. Yep. And it's so much more solid because then you know, you know, I, I did this experiment myself and I know what works best for me. It's not that I followed Dr. So-and-so, you know, who doesn't even, never even met me. I know because I did my own experiment. You know, that's an interesting buy-in factor. I love what you're doing there, Emily. Of course, a therapist came up with this. So uh, <laughs> where you convince people that their plan is their plan, even though it's based on a template of some book or some author or whatever, um, it's still their plan. Because when it's your plan, you don't want it to fail. You do everything in your uh, power to not let it fail. What an evil, maniacal, psychological Jedi mind trick you do there. Yeah, because that's why we self-sabotage. Yes. You know, we're like, this doesn't work for me. This doesn't work for me. This doesn't work for me. Okay, well, what do you think will work for you? Oh, uh, well, I think, I think this would work. Okay, cool. Let's prove it. Let's, yeah. let's do it. Let's give it our best. Or you could throw them back at them. I don't think you're going to do very well, but you can try it. Go ahead. And they <laughs> double down like, oh, I'm going to prove Emily wrong. And then they come back and are like, see, I did it. And you're like, Mwah, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not that sneaky, but, but it does work. It does work. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And yeah, uh, Gina says exactly. No dogma, just do your own plan. And it's kind of what's depressing about the online world is people like, well, if I start keto, I need how much MCT oil? I'm like, would it surprise you to know I've never taken MCT oil? I don't, I don't use it. I mean, you can use it if you want, but it's not a priority to me because that's not in my plan. And yet people, they think even carnivore and some of the carnivore people have talked about adding in honey and doing this and doing that. And it's like, look, that's what they're experimenting with. That does not mean it is something you need to be doing in your plan. You can tinker with it, test it, see if that works for you. Trust me, I would love some honey baked uh, chicken at some point if I wanted to do it that way or put a little glaze on top of a, of a steak. But I know for me, honey spikes my blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So yes, that, that, that is such an, an interesting way of looking at it and definitely working on that inner clarity is so important to changing. Uh, so what's next for you? Are you? I mean, you're incredible, by the way, on your YouTube videos, guys, go check out her YouTube channel. Um, so what do they look up when they, you had some name for it? What Center was it? of Brilliance. Yes, that's what it was. I was like, Center of Brilliance. I'm like, okay, all right. All right. Yeah, because everybody has a center of brilliance. It's just covered up with, you know, all this junk, all this, you know, sickness and, and illness and everything. And we think that we're these broken people, but you're actually really brilliant underneath all of that. We just got to uncover it. Oh, man. I love that. I love that because people come to me so broken all the time. And I always kind of poke that bear a little bit and go, are you as broken as you think you are? And well, I've tried this and I did this and I'm not seeing this. And I'm not seeing that. I'm like, okay, but at the core, 
how are you? What are you like? How are you incorporating things into your life? What positive thoughts are you telling yourself? And usually that's where the rub is. They're not thinking any positive thoughts about themselves. And, yeah. and it leads them down this negative path of predictability, negative path. That, that if you don't think positive about a journey, oh, I'm gonna try this carnivore diet, it's not gonna work, but I'll try it. Well, don't be surprised if two weeks later, you're just like, Ugh, I'm tired of this. Yeah, because your pissy attitude at the beginning didn't help you. Exactly. Well, and it, it all started when I was a, a therapist. I was a child therapist. And um, I had this child, I, 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 many children, the parents would bring them to me and say, this is Johnny. And he does this and he does this and he does that. And he's bad and this and fix him. Wow. And I would tell the parents, thank you so much. You can go wait in the waiting room. And I would have Johnny come in my room, my office, and I would say, guess what? You're not broken. You're amazing. Yeah. You, know, you know that impulse that you get to talk in the middle of class? You know that impulsivity to, to, to take a, a, you know, a ruler and see how it looks whenever you attach it to this and you, you make a, a slingshot? You have a brain that normal people can't even think of the yeah. things that you think of. You are going to have this as a superpower and you are going to be superhuman. You are going to be amazing, but we need to manage it just like Superman would. You got to manage that power and get through school. <laughs> yeah. So here's how, you, how we do it. And then he gets better because he realizes that it's not that he's screwed up. It's that, that he has this superpower that needs to be managed. And parents do that. Like I, I think about my own dad and I was, I excelled academically despite his abuse towards me. Like what could I have accomplished had I been supported? Like I, I often think about that. I don't regret. I love the way my life turned out. I'm good, but you always have those little thoughts. Yeah. Like, what could have been? And like for you in your late 20s, what could have been if you'd been diagnosed with the bipolar and the MS and gotten control of it sooner so that when you had your kid, then the kid would know the real mom that he has now, you know, for exactly. all those to go through. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. But no woulda, coulda, shoulda here because we're very happy with where we are. I'm very happy we got Emily Pinton on here today, you guys. Carnivore Minds over on Instagram, go check her out. Uh, and yeah, you do a lot of great work and she does do a lot of Instagram lives herself. You got uh, herself, you guys, she's amazing at them. I do love your work, Emily. One reason I wanted you on here today, uh, she does put videos up at her YouTube channel, Center of Brilliance, go look that up as well. But Emily, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. It was a great chat. <laughs>